and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here to this uh, event, which is part of our Homerton 250 birthday celebrations. Many of the um, topics that we've dealt with in these, these uh, open lectures and so on have been science tilted, and it's good to see the other end of the spectrum, the arts honored today. It's often said that Homerton College is the backbone of thespian Cambridge, if not its entire skeletal structure. So it's entirely appropriate that in answer to one of our three burning questions that we're asking over the year, what it means to be human, that we take in acting, drama, and the subtleties of performance. There are so many people I could thank. I'm not going to thank hardly anybody. I'm just going to say thank you very much to our associate fellow, Abigail Rokison Woodall, who has choreographed today's events, to which uh, I hope you're looking forward as I am. Thank you very much. And I'm now handing over to Jill Chalter. Thank you very much, Jeff, uh, and uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, welcome, indeed, to uh, the Homerton 250 Drama Special. Uh, my name is Joel Chalfin. I am uh, the current fellow uh, uh, at Homerton in Education and Drama. And um, whilst I can't take, uh, take full uh, responsibility for bringing this event together, it has been the work of a number of people. I am introducing the, the event to you all uh, for this evening. Um, the evening uh, t uh, tonight, we celebrate Shakespeare as a writer for performance uh, and explore together how his poetry is not confined to the page, but are words to be inhabited by the actor, embodied in the audience, and given meaning in the theatre. The evening will happen, if only to meet good form, in five acts. Uh, you're already into the first act, you'll be pleased to know. Uh, in the second, there will be the, what is the second official launch of a new Arden Shakespeare series edited specifically for performance. In the third act, we will move on to a masterclass on Hamlet uh, with the participation of five of our current Homerton students. Next, in the fourth, we will move to a panel discussion with three alumni of the college who are all now working professionally, uh, directing the the in theatre, uh, and particularly directing Shakespeare. Now, all of that means, as Jeff has already indicated, that there are far too many people for me to introduce to you. Uh, so if you feel at the end of that fourth act that you still don't fully know all the characters, uh, I invite you to use the fifth act of the evening, which is canapes and drinks in the Great Hall, uh, to come and meet them all. The University of Cambridge is very well known for its theatre scene, well known both for its quality of student production and, of course, for its alumni, who have gone on from here to take leading roles in British theatre, film, and television as directors, actors, writers, and producers. No better example of this is, of course, our guest this evening, Simon Russell Beale, whom I am confident needs for you no introduction. The irony, of course, of the university's reputation for producing such great practitioners of the theater as Simon is that drama as performance or as an audience's experience of theatre, has never been formally accepted into the university's academic structure. There is no faculty of drama, and as such, there is no official home for conversations such as this one, in which the interpreting practice of acting is submitted to critical appraisal. The conversation that we're having tonight is by no means unique, uh, to this evening, but each time it does take place, it does so almost self-consciously as an act in itself, an act of resistance, of a sort of non-conformity. Just over 80 years ago, a comparative event took place at the university devoted to a discussion of drama as drama considered in relation to theatre. I quote from the opening address given by the great reformer of British theatre, 
the actor, come director, come critic, and first advocate of a national theater, Harley Granville Barker, who stood before a, a similar audience to you on a similarly summary evening uh, to declare that that event was a landmark in the history of drama in England and a happy reconciling of university and theater. Now, of course, there have been many notable additions to that landscape over the years since 1934, but amazingly, much of the framing of that event remains uh, surprisingly resonant, even for today. Except, perhaps, that Granville Barker was not so aware that even in 1934, there was a corner of the university in which the study of drama was a curriculum subject. Here at Homerton College, there had already been a purpose-built theater for 30 years. Overlooked, no doubt, by its independent status as an approved society rather than a full college, and in its provision of education merely to trainee teachers, this was still an affiliated institution of the university at which the staging of plays was regarded as equal to their literary analysis. A slight wink, perhaps, to the college's own history, rooted as it was in nonconformism. It was an academic commitment that retained its significance through the rest of the 20th century and till now under the leadership of lecturers who valued the production of plays as the primary route to understanding them. If there is then a rightful home for such conversations as this one tonight, Homerton College might just be the place to claim that title. I mentioned the leadership of lecturers over the last 80 years. Uh, Simon is here uh, with us as one of three editors of the new Arden Performance Editions of Shakespeare. Professor Michael Dobson and Dr. Abigail Brokerson Woodall. They all share a professional interest in the value that performance brings to people's lives. Michael, as the director of the Shakespeare Institute and professor of Shakespeare at the University of Birmingham, whose work has illuminated how Shakespeare's extraordinary writings, to quote Michael himself, have stimulated and enabled creativity in others. But it is to Abigail that our thanks to this evening are entirely due. Abigail was my predecessor as the lecturer in drama, and specifically drama production, uh, just at the time that Homerton's identity as the College of Education was transferred over to the university's Faculty of Education. Abigail herself had inherited the post from the playwright Steve Waters, who is sitting with us here and will be chairing the panel discussion, and also from Peter Raby, who led the drama department here for over 30 years and who joins us today in the audience. This line of inheritance, one which I slightly foolishly uh, liken to uh, Doctor Who, is nonetheless a family tree that represents a historic commitment to performance that Homerton has surreptitiously harbored within the university. I very much hope you enjoy the evening, enjoy its various acts for each that they bring to you to this evening. Before I finish, I cannot complete this introduction without a moment of housekeeping. So uh, I need to inform you that there are no expected fire alarms this evening. If there is one, it is for real. And you should choose one of your four fire exits, uh, whichever one you feel looks most attractive, to exit by as soon as you can. Uh, the only other point is I ask you not to take any personal photos of this evening. All the images that are being taken will be available to you afterwards uh, for you to browse through. Enjoy the evening, and at this point I hand over to my friends and colleagues, Abigail and Michael. Good evening. Thank you very much for, um, for coming and for um, a very warm welcome. Um, we're, as, um, as you've been told, it's, our, it, it's the second launch of our uh, Arden Performance Editions. Um, 
we're delighted to be launching them in Cambridge. I'm just going to tell you a tiny bit about them before I hand over to Michael to talk about them, and then he's going to hand back to me again. Um, these are editions um, that I suppose, take on. Um, they come from they come from Arden, who are who are famous for their fantastic scholarly editions of uh, Shakespeare. Um, but we felt that perhaps the theatre now wanted um, editions that were particularly designed for use in a rehearsal room, and that's what we've tried to do. So um, myself and Michael and Simon are the general editors of the series. Um, so far, I've edited Hamlet and Midsummer Night's Dream for the series. Um, Paul Menzer has edited Romeo and Juliet, and Anna Camarilli has edited Much Ado About Nothing. And we have Othello and Macbeth forthcoming um, in the next uh, year or so. So we're delighted that the series is growing. And we're just going to tell you a little bit about what we've done and why this evening before handing over to Simon to um, do a masterclass. Thanks. Lovely. Yes. Um, and this is how to recognize them in a bookshop. Uh, that's, what, uh, that's what the covers look like. Um, I should stress that I'm not here purely out of naked self-interest uh, this afternoon. I'm here largely out of an overpowering sense of guilt uh, as the person who lured Abigail away from Cambridge to come and work in Stratford uh, instead. Um, so, you know, I, I should probably feel too ashamed to speak in Cambridge at all, um, were it not for the fact that I'm a major financial benefactor of Cambridge University, uh, as my daughter finished an English degree here uh, not very long ago. And, and if, if I appear emotionally drained, I mean, she didn't do much theatre, but she did lots of opera. If I appear emotionally drained, it's because I went last night to the Royal College of Music to see her create the role of hipster cupcake in a powerful new opera about a hungry bear, uh, which is you know, extraordinary. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's nice to see her being used uh, as anything at all. Um, let me, um, let me uh, explain more about what we wanted to do with these editions. Abigail and I, as you know, Abigail as a, as a practitioner as well as a pedant, uh, and me just as a pedant, um, we, for years we have obviously suffered from seeing actors and directors make certain mistakes which we would like to uh, tr do our bit to avert. Uh, but we didn't want to produce the kind of acting edition that tells actors what to think. Uh, in fact, we wanted to produce editions which would be highly practical uh, and would not tell people what to think, but would show actors what choices are open to them, possibly show them more than directors would like them to know uh, in, in rehearsal rooms. So we made various design choices about these books. We wanted them to be absolutely up to the minute with textual scholarship about which words are really the words that were probably used in the original performances, which commas belong there, um, all those things that text where they agonize about. But we wanted them to be readable in your hand like that. We wanted them to be highly portable. We wanted them to leave enough space on the page for people to scribble on. Um, and there were certain things we felt that uh, deterred actors and directors from using good scholarly editions uh, when preparing productions, one of which is simply that they tend to be thick and heavy because they've got so much stuff in them. Um, you know, great stuff if you're studying the play, but stuff you don't necessarily need from one minute to the next if you're trying to work out how to put it on. Uh, stuff like long essays about who guessed which bits were misprints when, um, immensely long footnotes about variant spellings of particular words. I mean, in an Arden edition, because they, they're designed to give you a summary of what everybody has thought about the play and what the key issues are in deciding its text, you're quite often going to get two lines of Shakespeare at the top and then about 40 lines of small print uh, explaining who has argued most vigorously about the two lines at the top uh, over the last 400 years. 
actors don't want that, and they're, they're often put off by it, um, even though some of the stuff in those notes may well be uh, of relevance to them. So we wanted the, the page to be reasonably big so that the print could be reasonably big, but we didn't want it entirely cluttered up with footnotes. Yeah, look, we wanted them to be practical, empowering, and not prescriptive, frankly. Uh, there we are. Now, they're actually more readable than this in practice. <laughs> You know, we, we're not really catering for telepathic actors. That wasn't the idea at all. Um, if you want to find out what these pages actually say, the best way is to buy the book. Uh, but you may be able to get a vague impression of the layout, uh, which is that you get the text on the left and then uh, some glossing on the right. Very short definitions of unfamiliar words. Uh, you know, that's what actors need. They need, to know, they need to know what it means. They don't need to know, you know who argued about what it's meant. Uh, they just need, they need to know what it means, and they don't want to have to fumble in the back to find out what it means, because then everybody else in the rehearsal room will know that they didn't already know what it means. You know, it's very important that you should just be able to look. Um, we provide... Um, as I say, quick definitions, the definition you need to actually speak the word as though you know what it's doing in the sentence. Um, but also, we were concerned, and this is a particular obsession of Abigail's, um, she's you know, published a prize-winning book about verse speaking. You know, we're sick of hearing things pronounced unmetrically. Now, there may be reasons why you don't want to pronounce something metrically. You may want to make a word sound more familiar. You may not want to stress it the way an Elizabethan would have done in case the audience doesn't recognize it at all. But we thought actors should at least know um, how these words do and don't fit the basic alternating rhythm of iambic pentameter or whichever other meter Shakespeare's using at the time. So we, and it's wonderfully Ill illegible on these slides, um, do buy the books, please, for your own good. Um, we just put the syllables that you stress in bold. You know, so you know, if there's a word where there's any ambiguity about where the stresses might go in it, um, we stuck it, uh, we stuck the stress syllabus in bold. Now, the really exciting thing that uses up so much of the space underneath Shakespeare's words in uh, your, average, um, your average edition is the legitimate scope for discussion about textual variants. Half of Shakespeare's plays exist in more than one early printing. You know, sometimes, as well as appearing in the folio, there's also a quarto version. Or in the case of Hamlet, there's also two quarto versions, uh, which are excitingly different from, from each other. So one of the things scholarly editors do is make choices. You know, they say, well, the, first quart the, the second quarto is maybe an early draft. The folio is a version after it's been performed a bit and they've left some stuff out and redrafted some bits. Um, I think the text should, in this scene, should follow this text. Um, we have tried to make any legitimate choices where we've got two versions that both make sense and that Shakespeare probably both knew, knew in both cases. Uh, we try to show that you know, there, are, there are possibilities where it's, you know, you, you, you choose which one based on the requirements of your own production. It's not that you only get the one the editor favors in the big print at the top, and then a little tiny note saying, but another text says this, but I don't like it. Um, you know, we, it's, it, we've, we've tried to pr produce notes which are blissfully legible on the, in the actual books uh, that show actors, yeah, well, it's, you know, it's, it's solid in this text, it's sallied in the other text. Um, you know, which one do you fancy? Some people prefer sullied. You know, it's, it's, you know we, we, we try to make these things uh, eminently visible. Um, there should be a, a nice bit of Romeo and Juliet, but you can't see it anyway, so I'm not going to worry about that as much as I might. Um, we've also tried to put textual variants consecutively in, in the actual text, so that instead of giving the whole of, say, a shorter version of Hamlet, and then at the end, by the way, here's all the stuff we left out, which is from the longer version, 
We've simply put the longer stuff in, but marked in brackets, because it's easier to cut stuff in an, in an acting script than to try and cut it out of the back and sellotape it on or scribble it in uh, with little arrows. Uh, and I must say, a lot of what we did in terms of the design came from experience that we've had using new penguins, um, you know, which, which are nice, except the pages fall out, uh, and the notes are at the back, and there's not enough room to scribble on them, and some of the textual variants you can only find by flicking to the end. Uh, throughout, we've tried to make these highly readable and highly cuttable, so that rather than the director producing off a word processor, here's my cut, you'll never know about the lines you're not going to speak, um, everybody, if they're using this edition, will have it in front of them and they can then have a proper argument and say, look, yeah, I've, I'm, I think we should put a blue biro on page 46 and cross out that bit from the bad quarter because I don't think we should use it. And then, you know, actors can campaign to have lines put back in uh, and everybody can have a very interesting discussion uh, that they might not otherwise um, have had. Um, yeah, a metrical variance we indicate, as I say, there are ways in which you can and can't pronounce things. Um, and when it comes to stage directions, because you know, the actual printed texts of Shakespeare provide very little instruction um, about what you're supposed to actually be doing, and they'll often bring somebody onto the stage and then not tell you when they're supposed to go off, uh, so that you, know, you have the option of people standing around all evening, like you know, poor, poor, um, poor hero's mother who gets an entrance direction at the beginning of Much Ado is ne never taken off stage and never says anything. You know, it's an extreme case. It's, you know, it's a part to turn down, I would, I would advise. Uh, but um, Abigail had brilliant solutions to this, uh, which she will now tell you about. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Lovely. So, um, yeah, as Michael said, there are a couple of things which we've um, tried to do with the um, stage directions. I should say that, that um, the text, the, the illegible text, as it appears here, um, is more or less taken from the Arden Three editions. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel in terms of the text itself. Although with Hamlet, the um, Arden Three edition is um, Arden Three published each of the uh, Hamlet texts separately. So the paperback edition um, is actually just based on the second quarto of Hamlet. And this means that some things which um, you're more likely to hear on a stage um, are not in the Arden paperback edition of Hamlet. So, for example, Polonius um, says, neither a lender nor a... What does it say? Neither a lender nor... A, neither a borrower nor a lender boy, he says, in the, in the um, Arden uh, three edition, uh, because that's what's in the second quarter. And we decided that we'd never heard a Polonius say that on the stage before, so we would stick with neither a borrower nor a lender B, as it appears in the folio. So those are the sorts of um, textual decisions we've made. As Michael said, yeah, we've had to make certain additions about stage directions. Again, we've mainly stuck to what um, Arden 3 chooses to do. We've tried not to um, bulk up the edition too much by telling people where scenes are supposed to take place um, and that sort of thing. But there are a couple of things we have tried to do. One of them is um, early entrances. Again, um, I'm not going to keep referring to the illegible slide. Um, one of the things that uh, sometimes happens in the folio is that um, characters are given an entrance a number of lines before they actually speak. And in most cases, what editors have done is to say, well, that's clearly a mistake, it's, or, or possibly it's the time it took them to get from the back of the globe stage to the front of the globe stage, and therefore we're just going to ignore that and we're going to give them an entrance direction immediately before they speak. But we've actually thought about these quite a lot, and actually um, one example in Midsummer Night's Dream, there's an entrance direction for Puck an awful lot earlier than um, the point at which he speaks before putting the ass's head on bottom. 
And we thought, well, actually, actors might, and directors might like to know that. They might like to know that there is the opportunity to bring the character onto the stage a bit earlier and have him observe the, um, the action, and that that's a possibility offered by one of the texts. So that's something we've tried to mark in our texts. As Michael said, we've also, um, for the most part, we've tried to, um, I think Anna's taken out the stage direction for Hero's Mother, um, uh, Inogen. Um, but actually, I think she has put a note telling people that there is a stage direction in one of the texts because um, actually this has been used in productions. Um, if anyone saw um, Josie Rourke's production in the West End that had um, David Tennant as, as Benedict, um, that production decided to have Hero's mother, decided to give her some lines, but it did decide, it did decide to include her. Um, and there are various things. There's a, there's a ghost stage direction, again, for um, in Hamlet. There's a, there's a ghost stage direction for Ophelia to, to enter um, in Act 1, Scene 2. And often that's just taken out because she doesn't have any lines. But there's something quite nice about um, the possible presence of a silent Ophelia um, in, that, in that scene. And it's something that a lot of productions choose to use. So we've chosen to give it as an option. And again, not give it in a note at the front or a little note somewhere at the back, but to give it on the opposing page. Um, I'll say a little bit about the um, introductions. As Michael said, we were trying to keep these editions as kind of slim as um, possible, and we needed to be quite selective in working out what we thought actors and directors might actually want to know. Um, so we decided that they'd contain some notes on our editorial principles, a sort of user's guide. Um, we decided that we'd follow that by a short note on meter. So this explains some of the current common variants to iambic pentameter that you might expect to find um, in the texts. And then each individual edition's just got um, a section that explains various things about textual differences, pronunciation, um, etc. I actually did some um, research, which mainly involved interviewing Simon, actually, um, about what it was that actors um, and directors might want from uh, texts. Um, I also interviewed uh, Trevor Nunn and Gregory Doran and Lucy Bailey and talked to them about what might you want. Um, and interestingly, one thing Simon absolutely didn't want, did you, was a performance history of, of the plays. So that's actually something which we haven't included. We've reckoned that actually actors potentially don't want to know what other actors have done with a play before they do it, and that if they do want to know, there are plenty of places for them to find out. So we'd keep things as sort of light as possible. I'll just quickly say something about lineation and punctuation, and then I'll hand over to Simon. Um, the lineation of our editions is, for the most part, based on Arden III, but there's something that we sought to tackle, and um, partly because it's a slight obsession of mine um, that I sort of got um, very interested in when I was writing um, Shakespearean verse speaking. So, basically... Um, See if I can, yeah, okay. So for the most part, when we've um, got um, shared lines, we set them across the page so that you can see a metrical linkage. But there's an issue about um, instances where you have three short lines in a text which have potentially equal metrical claims to linkage. So you could do, so who my king saw who, my lord, the king, your father, or my lord, the king, your father, the king, my father. Um, what most editions do is choose to link one pair in favour of another. So that's, how, that's what Arden Three and the New Cambridge do. Um, Arden Three links saw who, my lord, the king, your father, and leaves the other one as a, a single short line. And the Cambridge has saw who, and then links the second two lines. Um, this may seem really pedantic and not particularly um, interesting, but it is interesting when you know that what actors are often taught is that a short line might indicate a pause to them. Um, and this is one thing that, that became clear to me was that actors using the Arden uh, three would tell me, after the king, my father, um, there needs to be a pause because there's a short line. And then actors using the Cambridge edition would tell me that after Saw Who, there needed to be a pause because there's a short line. Um, so what we wanted to show was that actually 
that is just editorial intervention. And so what we've done is we've set three consecutive short lines like that to try and show that it's a single metrical structure. Um, I hope that actors do read our introduction um, to realize that that's what we're we've, uh, we've done because um, it's uh, potentially, um, well, it's, it, it's not something that other editions have, um, have chosen to do. The last thing I'm just going to mention really, really briefly, which was um, the punctuation. This was a really, really difficult area because we're aware that actors and directors often find the punctuation of uh, modern editions too heavy. And a lot of directors strip all the punctuation out of um, editions before they give them to actors on the basis that um, it, it, um, that helps actors to find the flow of the verse better. Um, if you ever buy Stephen Unwin's um, texts from English Touring Theatre, the punctuation is kind of largely stripped out. And we started thinking that's what we might do. But actually, this became kind of arbitrary because you can't just start stripping punctuation out here and there um, because potentially you start to lose um, a sense of, of the meaning. So basically, what we've done is we've kept the punctuation of the Arden Three edition, but we have put a note in the introduction saying that actors aren't obliged to follow it, which may seem a bit of a cop-out, but that felt like um, the, the best advice we could, we could offer um, without getting to a point to give you an example, Claudius's first speech in um, Act 1, Scene 2 of Hamlet is punctuated as a single sentence in the second quarter of Hamlet. So if we were to go back to the punctuation of the early printed text, we could confuse actors more and, and mislead actors possibly more than um, by modernising um, the punctuation. So that's, what, that's basically what we've, uh, what we've done with these editions. And I'll hand over to Simon to... Makes me, yeah, useful um, now. <laughs> can you bring your chairs here? Can you bring, can you bring your chairs in the middle? Um, I suddenly remembered when I was sitting there. Not together. I was a student here at this university years ago. <laughs> and uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, and we came to a workshop, and I was part of the acting <laughs> people. And we came to a workshop which was led by John Barton, who died this year, of course, and uh, the great John Barton, uh, directing Jonathan Hyde in a workshop of uh, a, a King Lear, uh, Edgar's speeches. And we came to laugh, we came to sneer. So I do hope you'll be kinder to me today. <laughs> I mean, we sat there going, ha, well, no wonder the theatre's dead. Um, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, it's been fascinating, this experience, co-editing. I mean, I've done very little, but um, it's been fascinating because it appeals to the pedant in me. And um, I thought we'd just look at... It's, we, have we got it up? Oh, we have sort of, haven't we? Um, uh, every generation, don't they, say, oh, we're reforming verse speaking. Um, we did. Uh, and you read about it all the time in, by young practitioners. They say, oh, no, we're gonna, we, we, we have the answer. And they, they do. And we did. Because there's no set answer. And, but it's always a debatable thing. But it's always worth um, treating seriously. Because he wrote in verse, and therefore that needs to be respected. And I think there's a sort of the joy of editing this, co-editing this series is because is that I can indulge in my, my belief that actually the more you know about the structure of verse, the better and the more assured and safer you will be on stage. Um, so I thought we'd look at two... By the way, I presume everyone here, this audience of all audiences, knows about the basic principles of blank verse. Is anybody worried about that? Hands up, anybody who's worried about that? No? Good. <laughs> um, so I thought we'd look at two two uh, soliloquies of Hamlet. Uh, does he have about five, doesn't he, through the play? And each of them have a different, a very different quality. When, when I played it, when I played it, um, <laughs> I was very aware that each, each soliloquy had uh, a, a different flavour. Uh, as a parenthesis, I have to say, I used to hate to be or not to be, not because it was famous, I just thought it was boring. And then about halfway through the run, I suddenly realised it's 
it's very, very great indeed. Um, <laughs> I was wrong. But, um, so can we look at the first one? Who would like to just sort of stand up and read it? Go on, just somebody jump. Go on, yeah, OK. Uh, I've got your name already. Joe. Joe. Joe, come and read it for us. Shall this I? is the first. You don't have to act it, just read it. Because uh, it's a horrible thing to do. Come a little bit further forward. <laughs> a little bit more exposed. I'll find the page. Um, oh, that there's two, two solid flesh. We can move that one. Oh, got it. It's the first one. <laughs> just, just read it for us. OK. Oh, that this two, two solid flesh would melt. Thaw and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God. God. How weary, stale, flat and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Very good. Let's stop there. Um, how, would you, how would you prepare... So I'm looking at that rather than you, which is very rude. But it's just, <laughs> um, I sort of half know it. Um, how would you prepare... Would you do a sort of... Would you do, look at this metrically? Would you look, look at this as a piece of verse? Would you say, OK, it's structured in a particular way, a line? Or do you not do that? I mean, how would you look at, oh, this two I mean, flesh would melt, that line? I don't know. I think I'd just speak and see if it sounds right or what's... I, no, no, I think... Yeah, no, I'd just speak it out loud and see what sounds right. And then I'd try it with the verse and see which words the verse wants you to emphasise and see whether it fits the verse. Um, um, yeah. A director friend of mine, as a sort of tip, and I think he's right, he said that if I can possibly squash, not squash, if I can make the line conform to a regular iambic pentameter, then I will. And if I cannot in any way make that work, this is just as a, as a sort of guide, then I'll see what other options I can have. Now, the... the the reason why the iambic pentameter is important, and this is what I'd say about your little performance there, is that is the little bit you did, is that it, it gives a very assured beat to the line, and it gives you a base which is very firm, uh, uh, upon which you can do all sorts of acrobatics. Yeah. But actually, it gives you a very firm base, and I would, I would mark it up. I would say, I would look at that first line and decide where I'm going to put the stresses, literally, technically, and where would you yeah. put the stresses of that? Where would you do it on the first line? I'd say, oh, that is too, too solid, flesh would melt. So I do it on my hand. Yeah. Oh, that is too, too solid, flesh would melt. Oh, that is too, too solid, flesh would melt. And so that's how I'd be like, if yeah. following the so it could be an And then I'd be like, oh, that this too, yeah, too exactly. solid, flesh. Yeah, good. And so play around with it. I'd yeah. Uh, so in other words, you, you, you could actually do it as a, as a strict iambic line. Yeah. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Or you could reverse that first foot and go, oh, that oh. this too, too solid flesh would melt. And you also have a choice, of course, on, as Michael pointed out, you have a choice on solid or solid or salad. Um, yeah, I think I said solid. Around it. Good. <laughs> well, it seems to be what does salad mean? Well, salad means besieged, but I... I, 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 absolutely nobody at first hearing is going to go, oh, that besieged flesh, are they? They're really not. <laughs> um, but they might go, oh, that solid flesh. I, I, I agree with you, just uh, instinctively thinking, uh, if you can make sense of it first time mm. uh, to the audience, that's a principal job done, isn't it? And I, or, I mean, I'm, my pedant friends would... Would, <laughs> would might might disagree, and and uh, of course they have a very good argument for it. But I think in performance, probably salad is is the least useful of the options. But it's it's, it's in in this our edition, you have that option. Uh, what about the next line? Thor, Thor and results doesn't work. Thor and results. Thor and it's thought and, and resolve, resolve itself, itself into a Jew. It's the same Thor thing, isn't it? Yeah, you have to reverse that first. That first foot, don't you? Yeah. Thor and resolve to know. <laughs> Thor and resolve itself into a Jew. And as you know, that gives you just a little bit of a rhythmic 
foothold on Thor, doesn't it? And I guess it's also looking at what sounds are being used often, and there's lots of that yeah, very absolutely. open, like, yeah. Thor um, resolve. Talking of which, if, if you do reverse, and you weren't at all, but uh, never be afraid of O's. They're there, they're there for a reason, so you might as well. I'm not saying you should do a huge O, <laughs> but you could if you want. Uh, but it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not a, it's not, it's, it's, um, I mean, I'm not, not talking about the actual vowel sound, but you know what I mean? It's not, a, it's not an apologetic noise. And I notice a little bit on, oh God, God. God. <laughs> oh God, God, which became a sort of, yeah, I become very aware when I'm like doing Shakespeare of trying to, because I think that's the thing of making it, just like forgetting that you're doing it kind of means that making it, oh God, God. But then you kind of don't want to go the other way and be like, oh God. Well, it's a, it's a real it's problem. With, that with, it's a problem with, that's linked to the problem of making it fresh, isn't it? Yeah. And the, 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 re, the, the best way it seems actually that you can make this stuff fresh is make it as simple as possible. In other words, observe the form as much as possible. So that if you, if you try and pull it around too much, then you're going to make it both harder to understand and less, oddly, less naturalistic. Does that make sense? Yeah. I just, <laughs> just remembered I did, I was, I was taking that just to um, a speech of Richard II's uh, years ago. And for God's sake, let us sit, about, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. <laughs> <laughs> and he started, he was lovely, he was very camp, and he, um, and he went, uh, I said, okay, let's go. He said, oh, for God's sake, let us sit upon the ground. And I said, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't want to be pompous, but God for Richard II is a very, very important thing <laughs> and person. <laughs> and it's sort of a, a little bit on that, oh, God, God. That's what the O is for, is for a, a modern actor to give it give it a weight that we might not na naturally. Um, when you did those four lines, can you do those, those was it five lines, isn't it? Which? You went uh, probably one, two, six lines, wasn't it? Um, can you do it again for me? And this beat, this heartbeat is, 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 is the writer's gift to the actor to give you the engine. It's like a Rolls Royce. It doesn't have to be uh, rigid and you can play around with it in performance as much as you like, but underneath there's this fantastically sophisticated engine that Shakespeare's was giving you, and that therefore it has a sort of through line of sound. And I don't mean beauty of sound, I just mean a, a through line of thought, actually. Um, when you did it that time, you were just reading it for the first time, so it was uh, a little jagged. Yeah. Uh, can you do those five lines as if you were doing absolutely strictly, yeah. oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and result? It has an absolute, yeah. oh, it's like a squeezing toothpaste at a mill. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's sort of yeah. really, and it's really power. It's power, actually. Yeah. So, you, you so the punctuation, <laughs> so don't before. pay attention to the, the commas. Oh, the end of the lines. Oh God, melt. Oh, um, punctuation. We get we get into a real problem with punctuation later in the speech. Um, so run over. N no, actually, no, no. Well, you wouldn't if you're going. Bidum 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 bidum. Bidum, 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 bidum. It sounds so funereal, doesn't it? <laughs> but if, you were do it, if you're doing that in your head, you wouldn't yeah. actually stop at the end anyway. And you have to stop before Thor because of the... Boom, the depth charge of Thor. Shall I mark out the stress? Go on. Um, 
Who wants to do this again after this? <laughs> Same speech. Yeah, I'll go. You? <laughs> Someone has to. <laughs> it's quite difficult to describe what I mean, this sort of... Um, it, it's like a, 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 a mattress, a, a rhythmic foundation, and if you play around with it too much, you lose your footing. It's a, it's a very, and I, you can feel it happen in performance if you miss, if you miss stress, for instance. Yeah. Okay, give, give it a... Okay, so I'm... <laughs> power, power. <laughs> which, which stress are you doing at the beginning, by the way? Sorry? What stress are you doing on the first line? Oh, that, this too, too soft. Oh, that, that's shit. Okay. So I'm following the, I'm following the meeting. Yeah, that's right. So I do it with the... <laughs> okay. Um. Oh, that's a lot of pressure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All in one breath. Yeah, take a big breath first up. With. Okay. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Take, 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 take your time. Okay. Ba -boom, ba -boom. It's, it is oh, literally the heartbeat. It's, it's too, actually too literally the heartbeat. Flesh. Okay. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self slaughter. Oh, God, God. How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Yeah, it's, 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 it is better. Um, <laughs> the, uh, not that it was bad to begin with. <laughs> um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, right, you come in. Do, do, do you want to try that first five lines? I've forgotten your name already. Santhi. Santhi. Yes. Uh, try that first five lines. Well done. It's, it's, to, do, it's to do with... It's to do with the sort of uh, the, the sort of continuum of sound. I, I, um, oh, that this too too solid flesh would melt is not the same as oh that this too too solid flesh would melt. Yeah. And you you had a tiny little tendency to go oh that this too too solid flesh. So the sound the actual continuation of the sound. And I'm, and I'm not, I'm, I really am not strict about this, because you can break the sound up when you, whenever you want, but you have to do it for a reason. If it becomes a sort of uh, a jerking engine, uh, I'm not a driver, but whatever, with the, you know, uh, you know uh, an engine that's... Uh, stalling. What's it? Stalling. <laughs> Just a tiny bit of stall in, in the sound. Yeah. Oh, it's a bit done. <laughs> Can I try oh. it one more time? I'm going to try it one more time. <laughs> Santi, stay up here. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so I need to... Just take it a little bit slower and, um, and use the vowels, uh, not in a voice beautiful way, just use them to get you through the line. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Ooh. <laughs> Okay, and the verse, don't use You have it, to observe it, yes. Okay. Big breath. Okay. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God. God. How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Seem to, seem to me all the uses of this world. Yeah, it's, 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 it's getting there. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, you did against, which is, doesn't help you. Um, it's against, but that was because rhythmically. And oh. I think probably you do that, have to do something funny on a uh, thought and resolve itself into a do. You're right to stress, I think, two of the into, but of course it's a, 
it's a, st a stress you have to sort of disguise. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you go Thor, Thor and resolve, Thor and resolve itself into a dew, it sounds a little bit Thor and resolve itself into a dew. I mean, it's sort of, it's, it's, a, it's a halfway house, I think, on that. Yeah. It's neither in nor to. Well done, brilliant. Let's go, let's give us Thank you. We've got about 20 minutes. Right. Can you go on from fi on, oh, uh, fi on to, oh, fi. <laughs> that would be lovely. <laughs> lovely. Where to, or should I just Fi on to our fi, from there, it's about okay. six lines down. Lovely. Just give it a whirl. <laughs> Fi ont a fi, tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed things rank and gross in nature, possess it merely. That it should come to this, but two months dead, not say so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this Hyperion to a satyr, so loving to my mother that he might not beteem the winds of heaven, visit to roughly, visit her face too roughly. Good, well done. Um, <laughs> This is, uh, I want you all to do this actually, because this is an amazing bit of this, this, the middle section of this speech. This is why it's so different from to be or not to be. Um, fi on to our fi, it is, I'm afraid you probably have to go, it is an unweeded garden. I think you, it is an unweeded, yeah, actually you could go, it is an unweeded garden, <laughs> but it, 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 it doesn't give you quite enough um, support. Fi ont a fi, it is an unweeded garden. Yes. I think. Fi ont a fi, don't be frightened of it. Fi ont a fi. It's, I mean, it's a really odd line. And it's, <laughs> cut, it's cut in. Where's it been? It was cut in one of those um, performance editions that you were talking about. Oh, yes. Yes, there's, there's a series of performance editions, full performance from the 17th century or 18th That's century. 18th. 18th century, and they cut fi on tar fi, and I'm absolutely sure it's because the actor went, I can't, I, I can't do fi on tar fi. Um, uh, fi on tar fi, it is an unweeded garden. I think it just gives you a little bit more yeah. ballast. Um, this whole section, which you all can do, is like a single sentence. This is where punctuation becomes a debatable point, because... Fi on ta fi, it is an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely, that it should come to this, but two months dead, nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this Hyperion, to a satyr, so loving to my mother, that he might not between the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember, why she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what she... I mean, literally, is he's not stopping. And there's a picture of the someone unsettled with grief. It's the most um, amazing picture of that because he can't, he can't uh, settle on a, a single thought. And that, visit her face too roughly, heaven and earth must I remember, this is why I'm saying, the, this is why Abigail was saying the, the punctuation is optional. That heaven and earth must I remember is almost in parenthesis, isn't it? Um, or a dash. He, he, he's visit her face too roughly, why she would hang on him, he could easily say. But he, he has that little, little thing where he, him, it just he, the, the memory. <clears throat> so somehow you've got to keep what I was talking about with you, a Rolls Royce of rhythm, at the same time as showing distress of thought and an inability to settle on a particular thought and keeping keeping the syntax and the grammar, grammatical structure of the, uh, the um, speech going, because he's not settling, uh, the language is not settled, grammatically or syntactically, um, until much later, we'll see that later. If you can start again on fi, on to fi, and just remember what I was saying to, oh, I can't remember your name, Joe. <laughs> fi, on to fi. Right. Go on. Fi, on to fi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a well. <laughs> Japanese actor. <laughs> uh. Lovely. If 
Defiant our fire, tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed, things rank and gross in nature possess it merely, that it should come to this, but two months dead, nay, not so. <laughs> you nay, can't do it all in so one breath. <laughs> You'll have to take a breath. But yeah, it's the right idea. I mean, if you were working on this for months, you'd be getting all the thoughts clear in your head, but because uh, it, it's not just a single thing, it's that he switches. You know that exercise you were talking about, about change, he was talking about changing on punctuation, it's that. I mean, it's that the, he switches thought every time there is in this particular edition of change punctuation. Try to just try to end quickly, because I want to get to the end of this little section. Fiant a fire, tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely that it should come to this, but two months Don't dead. Worry. Nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this Hyperion to a satyr, so loving to my mother that he might not beteem the winds of heaven, visit her face to roughly heaven and earth, must I remember why she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown, but what it fed on, and yet within a month. You keep going. <laughs> and yet within a month, let me not think on it. Frailty, thy name is woman. A little month or other, those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body, like Niobe, all tears. Why, she, oh God, <laughs> a beast that once discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married with my uncle. Yeah, good, you got that. The, um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> Well, well done, Daniel, but very good. Would somebody else like to try this section from Fire on Fire? Go on. Yeah, I will. Right. Now, what's interesting about this, and we were getting there, is that each of those individual thoughts has to be freshly thought. Mm. It's very, very difficult. At sort of speed, but it's not real speed. Um, it's speed of thought, not speed of talking. Each individual image has to be clearly in your head. The most amazing one I always think is the shoes. Because what he's... His mother... Well, I've always imagined this. I mean, it's not quite right. But his mother wore the same shoes at the wedding that she wore at the funeral. And I just think it's, a, it's, it's sort of Shakespeare's his best, isn't it? He, he locates something so precise in, in Hamlet's mind. And you can imagine him in the church, you know, and, He's sitting there waiting, he looks down for the bride to come down here. And they think, oh my God, she hasn't even bothered to change the shoes or get a new pair of shoes. That's what she wore at Dad's funeral. And it's exactly the sort of thing when you're grieving that you yeah. focus on. So all those separate, separate thoughts have to be freshly yeah. invested. And then we got there in the end. Where, where do you think that... <laughs> Where do you think the climax of that sequence is? I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> by the way, it's Niobe on the first stress. Niobe. Married with my uncle. Don't you think? Married with my uncle. Yeah. That's where the speech is going. And that's, of course, the principal reason for his distress. So it serves both functions. Um, so if you could do somehow fire on top, fire right down to married with my uncle, thinking that you're going to be aiming for married with my uncle. Okay, sure. Fiant our fi, tis an unweeded garden. Tis an unweeded garden. Tis an unweeded sorry. garden. <laughs> it, just give, it, it gives you a little bit more weight. Fiant our fi, tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. That it should come to this, but two months dead, nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this Hyperion to a satyr, so loving to my mother, that he might not between the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth, must I remember? Why, she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed. And yet, within a month, let me not think on frouty, thy name is woman. A little month or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body, like Niobe, all tears, 
Why she, O oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married with my uncle. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Um, uh, we're not going to have time to do, the, to be or not to be this way. Um, uh, the months, 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 yeah. months, months. There's that marvellous bit where he goes, um, Found up I uh, to an unweeded garden that grows to seed, thinks rank and grows to nature, possess it merely, that it should come to this. Actually, that's, that's, that's the sort of beginning, actually, of the, that it should come to this. Right. Here we go. On the juggernaut. Mm -hmm. But two months dead. Ah, no, actually, it wasn't two months. It wasn't. It was, it was um, so less than that. It was less than that, actually. And, he's, and again, it's a brilliant depiction of... It's a sort of micro... <laughs> micromanagement of his own grief, isn't mm. it? It, it? Oh, no, it wasn't two months. No it, was, no, it was a day less than two months, actually. If I think, no, it was about 30 days and six hours. <laughs> you know, he's, 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 it's absolutely like little, precise little thoughts in his... But it's, he kept con continually changing the thought. But two months dead, no, not so much, not two. Is he revising the thoughts? Or is yes, he yes, absolutely revising oh, right, okay. thoughts. Okay. Yeah, it, it wasn't two months. It was less than, it was less than that, actually. Okay. Um, so he hears himself and then. Yeah. Goes and the set, and then he does that right the way through, um, uh, with uh, you know the frailty that name is woman and uh, 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 let me not think on it. You know, uh, no, uh, what was it? I can't see it now. This one. Must I remember? Right you know all that. All those little breaks. They're fresh. They're wiping thoughts out. Yeah. And then reintroducing them. Can you just do it once more? Um, Yeah, just think of... Direction. He knows where he's going, oddly enough. Okay. He's, go he's, he's going to marry with my uncle. Right. Even if he's subconscious. He knows where the, the final sucker punch of this argument is going to be about how disgraceful his, mother, his mother's behaviour is. Ooh, ooh. No, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Married, he married, she married with my uncle. That's the final. Mm. Pum, 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 ting, pum. Arguments go off in his head like little mini fireworks. But he knows exactly where he's going. Mm. So try, try it again with that sort of undertow of From fire. energy. Yeah. Fiant are fi. Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. That it should come to this. Right, here we go. But two months dead. Nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this Hyperion to a satyr. So loving to my mother that he might not between the swinds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember. Why? She would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. And yet, within a month, let me not think on frailty thy name as woman. A little month, or uh, those shoes were old, with which she followed my poor father's body. Like Niobe, all tears. Why, she... Oh, God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer married with my uncle. Yeah, good one. Who wrote one of you two? Um, can I just, I want to hear that same passage again. You heard what I was saying. Poo, poo, bam, 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 married with my uncle. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the effect he has. Fire on it. Ah, fire. Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. That it should come to this. <sighs> but two months dead. Nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this Hyperion, to a satyr, so loving to my mother that he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth, must I remember? Why, she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on, and yet within a month, let me not think on it, frailty thy name is woman. A little month, or ere those shoes were old, with which she followed my poor father's body like Niobe, all tears. Why, she, oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married with my uncle. 
Go on. My father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Would have been a month. It's a brilliant, brilliant joke. That. Mm. Um, the, uh, how much longer have I got? What? Uh, about five minutes. Five minutes? Oh. Oh, haven't I done, haven't done you? Um, no, well, no, just, um, um, it's the first time you've done it. He's not there. Yeah. He's not there. He's there. And part of, part of the brilliance of this speech is that it's, it's out there and it's angry and um, however internalised his life may be in lots of ways, this speech is about... He's virtually said nothing up until now. He's just gone, yeah, OK, I'm wearing black, you know. Um, nothing. He sat in silence through the wedding, through the... And it just goes... Bam, 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 but it's out. I just noticed that you were going... And I say it's the first time you've done it, but you were going... Uh, uh, so occasionally it became... It went back in on itself. Mm -hmm. um, just try it and see it as a. Tell me. Yeah. Tell me. You want you want to tell me about about the funeral and the rest of it. Fie on it! Ah, fie! Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. That it should come to this, but no, what, two what? months so dead. You went, it should come to this. What? That it should come to this, but that two months what? dead. <laughs> that it should come to this. That it should come to this. But two months dead. Nay, not so much. Not two. Good. Hey, la great. Lovely. So excellent a king that was to this Hyperion to a satyr. That's another. That's, a, that's also a divided thought, isn't it? So, 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 so excellent a king. I tell you how excellent he was. Boom. That was to this Hyperion to a satyr. Was to oh, Claudius. So loving to my mother that he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth, must I remember? Why, she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. And yet within a month, let me not think on it, frailty, thy name is woman. A little month, or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body like niobeal tears. Why, she, oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer. Married with my uncle, my father's brother. Yes, you have, you'd probably have to take, continue that through. That it's lovely. My, my, uh, married with my uncle, my father's brother. Married with my uncle. You have to do it like exactly like that. <laughs> but, my you know, father's you know, brother. You know I mean. Yeah, he yeah. define uncle. Uh, married with my uncle, my father's brother, and I tell you what. He's no more like my father than I am to Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> isn't it? It's that. It's it's yeah. It's a it's a wonderful self mocking joke. Mm -hmm. At the end of that, married with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her galled eyes, she married. He does the same... I'm going to get you up in a sec. Right? He does the same sort of rhythmic device, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you've had that marvellous climax on married with my uncle, my father's brother. And basically, he, just, he thinks of that as incest. My father's brother, but no more like my father. Imagine. Within a month, 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 time, time, such a short time, days. You know, it's, it's, it's an obsessive speech. Um, within a month, yet, yet the sort of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing of her gore red eyes. Boom, she married. It's the same thing as my father's married with my uncle. It's the same hit on she married. He, I mean, he's very clear what he... He's obsessing about it. Yeah. <laughs> and what's so wonderful about the speech is, as I say, it has all those little, little, little flicks to the side of observation about shoes and about the fact that he would, wouldn't let the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly and, and she would hang on him. And, you know, he, he, saw, you know, he saw his mummy and daddy 
holding hands, and it was lovely, you know, because they love each other, and, and that's nice for a boy, you know, to watch. Um, well done. Let's, let's have, we've only got about five more minutes, haven't we? Can you take me through from that same point, the big, the big sentence? Sorry, which? That it should come to this, which is... Sorry. And then I want one person to do, or somebody to do, to be or not to be, just to finish Where's that on the page? That it should come to this. Oh, brilliant. That it should come to this, but two months dead. Nay, may not so much, not two. So, so excellent a king that was this to Hyperion to a satyr, so loving to my mother that he might not between, between the winds of heaven but her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember why she would hang on him, as if the increase of appetite had grown but what it fed on. And yet within a month, let me not think on it, frouty I am his woman, a little month or there those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body like noble tears, while she, O oh God, a beast that once discourse of reason would have mourned longer married with my uncle than my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month, yet at the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her galled eyes she married, O oh, most wicked speed, to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets it is not, nor it cannot come to good. <laughs> Very good. The, uh, uh, it's interesting, you have to combine speed with slowness. Yes. Isn't it weird? <laughs> so you'll get all the thoughts there, but you just have to use, use, use the words to, to, to support you. Mm. Uh, like, like Niobe, all tears. I mean, you, you, it, it's, it, as I say, I'm not a great, you know, I, I don't believe in the voice beautiful or anything like that, and I don't think there's a way of, of doing this that necessarily has to be beautiful. But it is, if you use, I mean, you're, you're sight reading it, so, um, as you all are, but if you, if you use the words fully, each word, then it, gi it just supports you. And as soon as you skip over one of those stressed words, you'll find it, you'll find the whole thing going through your fingers. And the, the great technical difficulty of this speech is that you have to give the impression that you're um, out of control, but you're actually in control. <laughs> Am I? <laughs> I'm sure you are. Um, uh, can you just try it again? Can you just do the... Uh, oh God, from there. Oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer. So you're sort of halfway through that big sentence. Oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason. I think it's that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Like, so now I would have, if, uh, if, if I were you, yes. I would go away and mark that up. Yeah. Oh, you wanted me to stop? No. Should stop. Oh God. Oh. Oh. I, oh. Very good. Oh dear, no, you're marvellous. Um, but if if you were if if for instance went discourse, which of course is how we say it now, but I think probably oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason. I'm afraid. Mm. Unless you wanted to reverse that rhythm, but you have to make absolutely sure that you know that you're reversing it. Otherwise, you go. Um, oh God, a beast that, oh, uh, a beast that, you know, you could, oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason. You have to make sure that it's, that reverse stretch is punched. Otherwise you'll find, I think then, that you went, Whee. It, yeah. the lie goes, Whee. it hits it and it flops. Yeah, it, is, it flops, it just goes floppy. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what I would do if you were to ever do this speech, uh, would you know, so would have mourned, so you reverse the stress, would have mourned longer, married with my uncle, yeah. you know, my father, and actually mark it up. So every time you do it, you, you do do that stress, even if you're playing around with it. I have to say, and then Michael hates me for saying this, but Michael did write something about my acting, um, where I, <laughs> he said I break up this verse a lot. So I'm not, I'm not saying you should never break it up, but 
I think is the first. He's denying it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Have the authority <laughs> to do so. When yeah, yeah. The, uh, uh, as a first, as a, actually for all of you, as a first principle, I think I would just go, and, uh, if you learn it with the stress in your head, then you can do anything you like with it. And you can split up a line halfway through, you can stand on your head, you can... And it's one of the great liberations of this type of stuff, is that once you've got it technically secure, you can just go anywhere. Thank you, you lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank I will, um, <clears throat> I will just ask you one for one more round of applause to, to Simon for taking these very brave students through this. Thank you all. As you can see, this is not the work of 45 minutes or an hour. This is, this, we have a snapshot on um, what intriguing really is the laboratory of the theatre and Jeff uh, kindly suggested at the beginning uh, by introducing our Homerton 250 theme, you know, that this is a chance to turn to the arts. Well, there's a science to the arts, and we begin to see really what we mean by the crossover in terms of the, the depth of research, the attention to detail, and the playfulness that you can have when you really get to know and really spend time with words. And so thank you, everybody, for contributing to that uh, work, of, work of research. Thank you very much. If you want... Um, and thank you also to Michael and Abigail for introducing us to the series. Uh, I'm going to hand swiftly over to Steve Waters, um, who is going to lead us through Act 4. There would, of course, normally probably be an interval at this stage, but you're not allowed one of those. Uh, we're going to keep you here under, uh, under all conditions. And Steve, if you want to take us into the next part. Yeah. So as Joel said, while they're getting mic'd up, uh, my name's Steve Waters. Um, so... I keep thinking of several things. Doctor Who is an indelible thing. I can't get rid of that now. So I'm trying to work out which doctor I was. I definitely think Peter was pretty much, you know, everybody uh, from the early 1960s through. To, I think he's probably David Tennant as well. He, he was pretty definitive as the Doctor Who. So I'm wondering if I was possibly Christopher Eccleston. I'm not sure. Uh, the reboot of Doctor Who. But then we've got Abigail. What is she? She can't be Jodie Whittaker. She probably was Matt Smith. So it was Joel. Anyway, it's very confusing. That one we won't get resolved right now. Um, so what's this panel about? Actually, I want to just quickly reframe it slightly because there will be Shakespeare in this panel, but warning, there might be other things too. Uh, and I hope that's okay with Homerton. I haven't checked that out with you know, top brass. Um, but I do know we have an amazing uh, group of speakers uh, and uh, alumni from the college, and I want to introduce them in turn. Before I do, uh, just let me just quickly explain who I am. There are details in the program. Um, I hope what I say matches those details. Uh, but it's just incredible honor to be back here, um, particularly for this 250th anniversary. Um, of those 250 long years, I spent six in the company of this college, and most of them in this building. So it's quite extraordinary to be back here, um, wow, uh, 10, 12 years on from that time. I left in 2006, arrived in 1998, sort of. Uh, I had my first play on in 1998, uh, and made a rash decision to leave my job down the road at Hills Road Sixth Form College, bizarrely enough. Most of my life has been on Hills Road. Uh, interesting place to live your life. And uh, came here and joined Peter to teach uh, drama at Homerton. And Joel's already implied that's actually already quite a complex thing to talk about and a rather special thing to talk about. And I'd actually just quite like to find out who you are, actually, before I proceed to introduce our wonderful panellists. Who here is a present student at Homerton doing drama? Wonderful, wonderful. And we obviously met some of those guys a minute ago. Uh, who's a present student at Cambridge doing, it, say, English or a related subject? Okay, great. Good, lots of students over there. What are you guys, are you mainly English students? Yeah, anybody not an English student? Okay, brave person over there, what do you study? Classics, well, there we go. Uh, yeah, 20 teachers, okay, well, we'll come back to that. Um, we've got staff here, can you just stick your hands up with your staff of Homerton 
present or past. Okay, wonderful staff of Homerton there. This is turning out to be a uh, rather sentimental <laughs> tour around the audience. And uh, is there anybody in this audience got nothing to do with Homerton whatsoever? Be proudly put your hands up. Okay, so that's what I needed to know, actually, because that will prevent me from saying lots of in-jokes and things that actually have no interest to you. But I suppose what I do want to say, which I think is what this panel is going to be about, is I want to sort of build on what we just saw there, which was in my view, one of the most terrifying things I have ever witnessed, and I think you, are, you, you all need medals, frankly. I was thinking, please don't call me up. For Christ's sake, that's just absolutely terrifying. Um, but what it, what it exemplified was this thing, I think, which is intrinsic in drama at this institution, which is something that we will talk about, I think, on this panel, as much as Shakespeare, which is this, this interconnection between study uh, and practice between teaching and creating, these between education uh, and theatre. Uh, and I think those things are a good way into our panel. So I said, what we'll do, why don't I introduce you in turn, and you can take a seat, then I will sit down in the middle of you, and then we can start to talk. It's sort of make it a real sort of Friday night at the London Palladium, or indeed Eurovision, which of course we were all watching last night. Uh, so let's start with Sarah, Sarah Gordon here. Details are obviously in the program about Sarah, but I think Sarah is a great person to start with because she has literally, I believe, made a life out of bringing Shakespeare in its many forms in front of young people, students, at a very, li very high professional level. And I checked Sarah on your website uh, for some of the testimonials on there, and I thought, I felt rather envious as a playwright of some of these testimonials. It was like, <laughs> This was perfect. <laughs> that was a student. Uh, you know, like a, 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 a key stage two student. This was perfect. And the, the teachers liked it too. So, uh, Sarah, please come up and take a seat. And we'll ask you a few questions about your work. Um, yeah, why not sit there? Uh, Sarah Gordon, ladies and gentlemen, whatever round of applause. Let's go come up. I'm going to distribute water as well because I think we're a bit short of water. Next up uh, on our panel uh, is Sam Yates. Now, I had the privilege of teaching Sam Yates. Uh, uh, I won't say everything he knows. Actually, I definitely won't say everything <laughs> he knows because he knows far more than I do. Uh, but immensely proud of Sam. Sam came to us 2002 to 2005. Um, I remember actually in this room, Sam, I think, watching one of your great pieces of Shakespeare, mask work, elements of the tempest in there, as I remember. Um, little did I know he would then go on to be described by GQ as one of the men of the coming century, I think. One of the 25 most important people on this planet of the male gender right now. So we're very honored <laughs> to have no, that's Sam not, in the room. That's not, that's not. I know that was the exact description, you can modify <laughs> that. Uh, but Sam has had an extraordinary career as a director, and I think that's another interesting thing we can talk about, actually, the way in which some of the work that's come out, as a lot of it has been in the mode of directing and performing, uh, and indeed playwriting. So, Sam, please come and join us here on the <laughs> stage. Take your water. And, and finally, and again, only in terms of chronology, Max Barton. Max was here 2008 to 2011, am I right in that? Uh, and in fact, I had the privilege of seeing some of Max's early work for the drama and performance exam, where he did this extraordinary production of Mark Ravenhill's Pool No Water. Do you remember that? I do remember. And I remember coming in thinking, how do I mark this? This is frightening and disturbing and brilliant. And Max had devised his entire own theatrical language based on Jacques Lecoq, I think, but you'd actually refine Jacques Lecoq's ideas, uh, into this production. He's gone on to work with Philip Ridley, one of the, one of the most exciting and terrifying contemporary playwrights, uh, indeed debuting some of his work. Alex Seat said your production of his play Kayonga? Uh, Caragula, yeah. Caragula, okay, yeah. should have looked at my notes. Uh, was the theatrical event of 2018, I think he said. So uh, it's a wonderful thing to have you here as well, Max. Come and take a seat. <laughs> Okay, so let me just set a few thoughts running. I hope everybody's okay because you have been sitting down a long time and you haven't been to the toilet for a very long time, so apologies for that. Um, but we are heading towards Act 5, which is toilets and canapes and drinks and the like. Um, so if I just sketch out some of the things I think were very particular about Homerton, and in a way it'd be interesting to hear from Sarah um, whether that was always thus, because obviously we can only speak to our own time here. But I think the first thing that crops up is it actually in the name of a specific course, Drama in Performance, Drama in Production, I can't even remember the name of the course, uh, which was a really large part of the student undergraduate experience. And it was one of the only places, and is still, I think, am I right, guys, still Drama in Production exists. Um, 
one of the few places in this institution, Cambridge, that you can be marked for acting, designing, lighting design, uh, playwriting, uh, directing, and devising as well. So there are a number of things that were, if you like, uh, very important, I think, about having a course like that in your slate. I'm going to mention a couple other courses as well. Uh, during my time, we used to have a course called Arts and Performance. And this is no, I don't think this has actually survived the last two incarnations of Doctor Who, as it were, for very good reasons. But I think I want to mention that as well, because that was an interdisciplinary course. So it was a mixture of, as the title suggests, the, the visual arts, uh, music, and theatre, uh, dressed as one subject. So they were, and, the, and I'm mentioning these courses because they were already in play by the time I arrived, and I think they had a long standing history before them. So there was a degree to which if you came to Homerton to study drama or BA in education studies with drama or what it was described at when you came or a B.Ed., uh, you were going to be doing what those guys did just now, which was standing up in front of people and, and doing practical work. And Sarah, do you mind starting off? What was it like when you were here in, in the mid-80s, really? A long time ago. <laughs> Is my mic working? Yeah. yeah. Um, it was a different course, but it, had, it bears a lot of similarities to what you've just described. So it was a B.Ed. in drama, um, lots of practical work, lots of, um, in, in my case, primary school orientated drama. Is that Chris up there, who taught my course, who I've just spotted over there, so thank you, Chris. Uh, and Peter over here as well, and Morag, an absolute guru in, in poetry, and anyone else, if I can't see you, fantastic to see you here. Um, it was, in those days, it was very much that the education pra theory and practice was interwoven to your main subject. My main subject was drama. So I had the privilege of spending an awful lot of time in what was the drama studio on a different... Is this the same footprint, or was it somewhere else? It's a similar sort of shape, and it feels very similar, but that was our home, the drama students. We, we lived in that drama studio. The, the college has changed a lot, and yet it still feels very much the same sort of spirit. Um, but the, the, we did a lot of work in schools as well, so we went out into, in my case, primary schools and did a lot of things that actually weren't drama. Uh, so I spent a lot of my time doing things that, that I actually struggled to teach, really, because maths was certainly not my thing. Um, and, and it was only once I got out into the world of teaching that I thought, it's the drama that I'm good at, it's the drama teaching, there's not enough of this in schools. And, and I still feel, actually, there's not enough of this in schools. People are not confident to teach drama. Um, and it wasn't only drama that I wanted to, to teach and wanted to forge a way through and wanted to, to enable other people to, to, to teach and to enjoy, um, but it, it was actually specifically Shakespeare. So in my first year out of Homerton, after four years, the B.Ed. drama was four years, um, I, I actually did a whole terms, this was pre-national curriculum, so I had the privilege of spending a term doing Macbeth with my class of children. And that's really where it started. I then came back to Cambridge and went and knocked on Dr. Rex Gibson's um, door, and, and, and bless him, Rex is not with us anymore, but, but how I'd love to pay tribute to him. He ran the Shakespeare and Schools project. It was a groundbreaking project, and any of you interested in Shakespeare and education must look up Rex Gibson. He was the, the, the guru of, of all things Shakespeare and education. And I knocked on his door and I said, I believe there's, there's something in this. Can, can, will you supervise me? And he said yes. And I joined the Shakespeare and Schools project and went off with a lot of heads of English from secondary schools. I was the only person interested in primary school Shakespeare and join them and develop my own work along the lines that they were doing, which was very much get up on your feet uh, and do Shakespeare, take it away from just sitting and reading it round the class and make it active. And I coined the phrase active storytelling, and, and that active storytelling is what feeds into everything that, that we do now as the Young Shakespeare Company 30 years later um, in our workshops, inset, resources, productions, and, and all the time that we spend in schools, and we visit about uh, 800 schools every year and have probably worked with mm, maybe millions of children, actually. So the lovely, most exciting thing for us is when actors come to us and say, I had you into my school when I was eight, and I remember it, and I've come to audition for your company. So, yeah, that, this is where it all started, so thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I mean, it's a fantastic sense of this um, continuity, um, but also I think it's really important for we turn to Sam a bit to think about the, 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 the role of education in the equation. Because it, it even, 
it tells us something about Homerton's own staff, actually, the people who were working here, their, their inclinations. Quite often there was a sense that, you know, perhaps some of them didn't have PhDs, I will include myself, that might be other forms of experience would be actually valid uh, to, to inflect their teaching. Sam, you came here, as we, we've mentioned already, sort of mid-noughties. Um, and what, why did you come to here specifically? Was there something about the course that appealed to you? Um, it was purely because it had drama in the title. Although I actually should say um, that I applied <laughs> for the drama and education uh, one and didn't get it. Uh, but I, got yeah, I, I didn't know if I just say that introduction, Sam. I'll talk to you about that afterwards. It was after. absolutely horrendous. The day I came down for the interview here, it was really foggy, and we drove from Stockport, and Dad drove and left enough time, and we were so late that I missed the drama workshop, so I didn't have the opportunity to dazzle Steve with my... Uh, <laughs> God knows what. Um, but... Uh, what was the question? Yeah, we were just talking about why you came, actually, and what you, you said that there was the drama, because obviously there are other drama courses and, you know, other institutions that have drama. Yes. This is, in a way, as Joe was saying earlier on, there's something quite curious about the drama here, which is that it's sort of smuggled into Cambridge in so many respects. Yeah, yeah. What, what appealed to you about that? Um, well, I didn't, I genuinely didn't ever plan to come to Cambridge. I didn't really know much about it, I have to say until I found this course um, and I got a sort of grade better than I thought I was going to get A-level, so I was a bit like, oh, perhaps I should apply. Um, so I had a place at Warwick guaranteed and I thought, well, sod it, I'll take a year out and I'll reapply to here and had Warwick and got it. So it was really about people going, you should apply. And, but if, you, if there wasn't a drama course there, I wouldn't have come for English. I don't think so. I just thought the idea of putting it down for three years was a bit scary for me, really. Mm -hmm. But having been here now, it's interesting you say about not having PhDs. I don't know what other people's experiences are of teachers, but I think it's very healthy if um, people are working in the industry in some little way, or if they have in the past. I think it's, there's, certainly in my time here, there was Peter, who, who is still obviously working. In fact, the last time I saw Peter was outside. Uh, late, was it Lady Windermere's fan at the Vaudeville? Anyway, one of the wilds that Peter was helping on, and I pulled him in to help us on Salome, which was a headlong... Uh, play that we did, and Steve, of course, is extremely active. So I think it's a very healthy, and also uh, of the other people I see you talking here, I see Steve and Janet over there, are huge theatre fans, and would always come and watch the stuff you did, even though they didn't have to. So you felt like you had mentors and people helping you, and being engaged and interested. And uh, you know, I think anyone who's involved in drama knows that a bit of a praise in the right direction from someone who you admire goes a long way. Yeah, Max. You, I mean, you actually came. I think when you were here, Sam, Homerton was if you like, being absorbed into the university. Mm -hmm. There was this kind of marriage of the education faculty, which obviously you had a lot to do with Sarah, which was a separate institution, even separate spatially. It was up, up around the back of Brooklyn's Avenue, I think, at mm. that stage, uh, and Homerton. They sort of, sort of blended in, in, a, in an interesting way in the middle of the noughties. So by the time you came, Max, uh, it, there was no more ba B Eds. You know, there was BA drama and education studies, right? Hmm. Now, what did the education studies element was that a factor in you coming, or was it you wanted to do drama at Cambridge, or what was it about? Well, I was I was actually doing a, a music degree at another university, <laughs> um, a commercial music degree, playing guitar, and then uh, I discovered it, and it felt like I'd kind of found a hack or something into <laughs> Cambridge, <laughs> and I saw this drama, and I. And I I'd been doing theatre and been trying to do theatre there and struggling to find like-minded people, I guess. And then found that out, um, came along, so absolutely the same as Sam, like, drama was that word, that, that key word. And then actually, it, you know, came here and Abby was phenomenal. I mean, Ab Abby's helped me so much in my, in my career. But um, I did find the education course extremely, su sort of surprisingly... Um, helpful to to my work I guess and mm. and much more afterwards than at the time I think you know I I, I look back on psychology particularly I, you know if people don't know Homerton and don't know that course it's the education part is broken up into a million chunks as well mm. so you've got like the psychology and the history and the philosophy and sociology and then other modules as well and I think that doing English drama and all of those education disciplines made it an incredibly kind of broad course. Mm. Then the theatre opportunities here and in, in town at ADC and, and whatever allowed you to just really 
cultivate that. But then it, it, it allowed a grounding and all sorts of stuff. And I've made loads of work about neuroscience and psychology since. And that's kind of, it, it boiled away underneath somewhere. And I, in the last year, I, I, I remember doing the psychology of prejudice and the psychology uh, and positive psychology, sort of thinking about how the brain deals with those. And, it, you know, the combination of that, uh, having a, a grounding with, with, as I say, with Abby, who had some huge grounding within theatre and was, was giving that side of things, but then a, a whole range of other stuff that could, I don't know, throw in. It's, I mean, it's un, unparalleled right. anywhere, I think. Right. But yeah. No, I, absolutely. And I'm, one of the things that strikes me is a feature in all of your subsequent work that, that we could talk to a little bit is um, you, you're great, you're very entrepreneurial. You've actually created th your own theatre companies in, in both your cases, uh, and all three cases actually theatre companies. You, you've had a strong sense, I think, of the social dimension uh, and function and purpose of your work. So yes, you know, kind of work in whatever one would describe as mainstream conventional theatre, but also, you know, both you guys have worked outside of theatre spaces per se. You found yourself working, building new audiences, Sarah, obviously that is the bread and butter of your work that you, you know, you probably uh, would run a mile from a theatre, you're actually going into schools and school spaces. Well, we do a combination, actually. Yeah. We, work in, we work in schools all around the country, and so we work in school halls, and we work with, and I should stress this, you know, we work with children from all different backgrounds, disadvantaged schools, uh, children with English as an additional language. Um, we this isn't about sort of Shakespeare and privilege or Shakespeare and, you know, teachers who know about Shakespeare, quite the opposite. This is about introducing all children, giving them the opportunity to become imaginatively immersed in Shakespeare's plays mm. and Shakespeare's language. And we don't compromise on the language. So, yes, we do work a lot most of the time in schools, but we also have big theatre projects where children who've done workshops in their school hall with our actors come in and watch an abridged version of, say, an hour and a half of the play they've done a workshop on. And there's an absolutely magical moment when they start to, as perhaps 300 children at a time, join in with those little bits of language that they've encountered and immersed in their own minds um, as they're seeing these actors They've played the characters in the workshop, and here are the actors with all the full production values in theatres. So, yes, it's schools, but it's also theatres. It's that dual thing. It's all live theatre, um, and that's what's important, but some of it is live theatre in a theatre space itself, so it's a combination. But, I mean, yeah. just to, to build on that sense of you have felt empowered to create the conditions in which you make theatre. I think it's true of all three of you, actually. Mm. Um, and, I mean, I'm sure there's a pragmatic dimension to that, which is, you know, how do you get work? You make your own work, mm. basically. And I think if, if we teach our students nothing else, it's to say, you know, don't try and fit into theatre. No. You know, transform theatre, make it your theatre, make it, if you like, uh, a theatre that you, uh, that yet, has yet to exist. But I, I think it'd be great to hear a little bit from, from you guys as well about, Sam and Max, about uh, some of that work that you've been doing. Because obviously you've worked in what I would call new writing spaces or Red Lion or uh, Soho and so forth. But uh, obviously you've worked in Hampstead, Sam, and, and indeed in the West End. But you started off working in radically different spaces, didn't you? Uh, mm. Tell us a little bit about that and whether that has any relationship to some of the work you were starting to sort of experiment with back here at Cambridge and in Homerton? Uh, so when, when I was here, uh, is the education thing is going to come up again here. I was sort of, my plan when I left was to set up a theatre and education company. Yeah. It was called Blank Theatre Company. It was going to do Shakespeare in a kind of total theatre way. I didn't quite know what that meant, but I kind of know what it means. <laughs> using masks, using music, using all different art forms. And uh, I was just going to make loads of money doing that, basically. <laughs> and so, but then I went to Edinburgh with uh, Macbeth that we did... Uh, we rehearsed here over in the dance studio, which is still here, I hope. It's not been knocked down. No, it's still here, the dance studio. Is it gone? The dance studio is still here. Oh, okay. Uh, so we took that to uh, Edinburgh, and that was very much like, it was called Macbeth the Hour. It was an hour long, and um, it was, uh, again, total theatre. Th and it was br really good. I mean, it's probably the best thing I've ever done. It's all been downhill from it. And the reason why it was good is I had no concept of... Uh, I, it was, A, devised over a longish period of time, like, well, two weeks, with loads of people who 
and we all cut together and kind of did yoga together. It was all like <laughs> fabulous. And uh, it was brilliant because I was completely free. And, and a large thing of any career, perhaps, is trying to get back to your kind of childlike sense of A, confidence, and B, wonder, so that you don't get crushed by the terror that The Guardian are reviewing tomorrow mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, but also getting back to... And then I've sort of done a strange journey. because I, I then understudied in the History Boys, so I acted for a little bit. And then I assisted um, some very brilliant directors, including Josie Rourke, who I know you've worked with lots of these, and Michael Grandage, and Trevor Nunn, and uh, Jamie Lloyd, and Phil Lloyd. And they were all working in the more commercial sectors. So once you go down that route, just by virtue of, well, this is certainly my personality, I kind of absorbed it and partly uh, assumed some of that style, whatever that style was. Um, Whereas when I came out, I, I was meeting with Complicite, told by an idiot, um, those guys, and not getting very far. But, it, but in a way, that's what I started at. And now, really, there's been a bit of a coming back to it. Uh, I've settled somewhere in the middle, probably. Um, but I suppose the entrepreneurial thing, yes, you're absolutely right. The first thing I actually directed was at the Finborough Theatre, which is a 50-seat pub theatre in uh, Earl's Court. And it was persuading these six actors to do it for 100 quid a week. And I raised uh, about... 20 grand by writing 500 letters to all the people listed in the back of the National Theatre Programme who give them <laughs> money and then just wrote cold letters saying, if you give me 50 pounds, you can be a bronze member and you get this, that, and the other. And then literally, and somehow it all kind of came together. And, the, and I must just say, because I've, I'm so grateful, it was, um, I'd assisted on um, a play called uh, Madame de Sade with Judy Dench. And I wrote to her after it, just saying, this is what I was trying to do. And I was not asking for money, I promise, it was more of an update. And of course, because she's so classy and generous, sent me a cheque which paid for all of the stamps, and there's a lot of stamps <laughs> to be sent out. And I, I photocopied that cheque, and I've got it there somewhere. <laughs> but I suppose that's a long way of saying that um, the first job was, and then you do, I don't know if it was the same with you, you do, you do the first thing, and you go, oh, brilliant, got great reviews, fantastic, sold out. And, and then you go, oh, the offers are going to flood in now, May, I'm done. <laughs> and you go, oh, Jesus Christ, we've got to do another one. So then you do, I did another one, and then you go, right, come on, then here it comes, and then no, and then the th I did a third one, and so on and so it's forth. It's the myth of the breakthrough, so. You just, and then it, does, it feels like that even now. I mean, it, it is a, it is, yeah, I used to, one of my other directors, Peter Gill, once said to me, oh, it doesn't get any easier, darling. And I was like, that guy's bollocks. Yeah, oh, that's absolutely bollocks. It's got to be. And then, of course, he's absolutely right. It, every job to get on feels as hard as the first one, but that's kind of... For and, and there's no money. I think it's worth reminding everybody that a director, uh, even on a professional gig, pays, gets paid £5,000 on average for a production. So think about many, how many of those you need to do a year to get minimum wage even. Max, I think you, you've had, a, in a way, a kind of quite a continental uh, beginning. Mm. You worked a lot in Berlin, I think, and certainly been influenced by European theatre. You've, you've got a very strong political strand to your work too. Do you want to say a little bit about that? So in, in your way of creating theatre, you, you've, you've really included that sensibility, it seems to me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, this is making me reflect a bit, because I actually talking about that broad variety of, um, of thinking, I, I don't think I'd ever really made that connection until you asked this question. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I think, I, like Sam, I guess I've, I've I'm massively like, uh, if you can like more than bifurcate, trifurcate, or <laughs> quadrifurcate. I don't know. Um, but I, so I've done, I did, a, you know, I've been Trevor's associate as well several times for, for years actually, and we're, we're co directing something at the moment, which is a bizarre <laughs> experiment. I don't know what that's going to make. But um, we, so there's that kind of side, and I'm, I'm working on a, a musical, and I just did a, a big musical in Cardiff at Wales Millennium Centre. And then there's the kind of, I've, I did a show in prisons, like, uh, late last year. And I think, I, I was just wondering, I was wondering how best to answer that, because I, I, I remember there was also, um, there's a thing, is there still a thing called the, the R&I? Is it called the R&I? Like a, an essay. <laughs> Horrible essay. Search <laughs> and investigation, I think. Right, that's the one. Yeah, yeah so, and, and I remember, because I, I remember that being, um, speaking about sort of what, what drama can do um, in a more social way. And I remember m mine was all about how, how drama on a curriculum is going to help all sorts of other things, not... It's not about training up a load of actors and directors because God knows we don't need them. <laughs> but <laughs> but it, it is it is about it's about a general approach to humanity, I suppose. And I think 
you know, of all the stuff that, that I've done, that, that work in, in prisons is by far the most, like, uh, sort of instantly, uh, like, Christ, this is, <laughs> this is, this is Im important, actually. And, th and that was, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to trace it back to here more than I, I think I'd ever realised was the case, possibly. I don't know. Um, but yeah, and, and you asked about uh, spaces and what, uh, I mean, absolutely, I, I did, while I was here, I did a, a production of Hamlet at the real Cromwell Castle in Elsinore, uh, again, a lot through, through Abby, who played Gertrude in the production. Um, but that was, and we did it, we did it site specific, we did it around, uh, up on the ramparts and down in the dungeons, or as, as far as we could get into the dungeons for health and safety reasons, <laughs> and, and in, in the, Queen's chamber, which had a, a little offshoot, which you could just hang the arras on, um, and it just it, it all made sense, and that was quite, uh, I suppose, revelatory. Or and I think I've done a lot of work in those sorts of spaces since, so, uh, in the basement of Shoreditch Town Hall, or in the in kind of factories or warehouses, um, and I suppose that was that was very much born here, and I think it's born out of the Homerton that Homerton course and that, because there are so many different spaces even just here, mm. you're, not, you're not just going, I'm gonna go make work at the main space in town, I'm gonna, so Paul No Water was up in the, is that still, does that still exist? That little studio? A small studio just upstairs, and it's still there, yep. And then I did a, a show called No Magic in here, which you also mm. came to see. Um, but, but, and then I've been right, really this year I've, I've been writing more than directing. I've, I've, uh, that's what I'm doing now. So I, I think, I think I've continued to be um, varied, <laughs> and maybe that was uh, maybe that was always always meant to be. Something. Yeah. Well, I mean, it seems that it, there are two imperatives, aren't there? There's one is which is that's a really good idea <laughs> professionally. I mean, we used to talk about the portfolio career quite a lot in the arts, you know, and that idea that actually. You know, yes, you can you can set out to be a writer or a director or an actor, but you might just want to also be able to operate the lights, be able to work in Cafe Nero. You know, you know, <laughs> you, you will have a complex career. I mean, it is a tribute to the talent of the people in front of you that they have increasingly turned their career to their primary inclination. And you know, I've been lucky enough to do that too. It is. But nevertheless, never unsupported by other activities. And I think, I suppose the ethos here is to enjoy that mm. uh, and to celebrate that rather than see that as a dilution of, of your skill and your talent. I think we should talk about Shakespeare. I, I said we weren't going to, but I now feel that would be wrong. Um, <laughs> I was also looking at Janet Bottom, who's sitting in the front row there, who probably taught most of you. Was she still teaching, Max? Did you get taught by Janet or would you, had you resigned by that point? Okay, not resigned, yeah, resigned. Um, you know, because, of course, the intersection between English education studies, drama, obviously the English faculty as well, uh, papers like uh, Shakespeare in Performance, which I don't know if it still runs in the English faculty, but was a vital uh, part of the offer of the courses within the English faculty. Mm. Um, what, what part does Shakespeare play in your development here and beyond? I mean, clearly, Sarah, you know, it's evidently part of your work, but presumably that, might have, that must have had an origin. Did that begin in your work here? Um, I think I had a love of Shakespeare even before I came to Cambridge, um, but that was certainly cemented through the course. Um, and actually, I'm just remembering that in that very drama studio where we spent our lives, we did a production of Midsummer Night's Dream. Do you remember? Peter, were you in it? You were, weren't you? <laughs> was there anyone else here who was in that? Because actually, um, it was Sue who directed it, and um, I think, or co-directed it, and she asked uh, lots of members of staff to come in and be the mechanicals, because we were a very small drama group. And so we had, who did you play, do you remember? Yes, you did, didn't you? Yeah. So um, we did this production at the end of our second year, and that was sort of assessed. But we did just that. We did um, everything from the marketing to the lighting to the costumes to, and, uh, to the acting, actually, the co-directing and all sorts of things. And we also collaborated with quite a number of staff. It was fun. So, yeah, that was, that was something. And then there was other stuff, obviously, going on in Cambridge at the time. Um, but it was always, there were always plays I'd loved. I'd, I'd often seen Shakespeare in the theatre, you know, from when I was 
young and loved the stories. Um, so actually it was just something that had always excited me and, and, and was kind of then cemented here and then I just went on. And it was just, it was that, that term of, of teaching and having uh, these year six children, they weren't even called that in those days, in my class, just absolutely taken over by Macbeth. Our, whole, our lives were taken over by Macbeth. And suddenly there was this, you know, this is really important. This is a way to access so many things that are so important in, in life and literature and creativity. And, and I think that's, yeah, then it went from there. Yeah, no, uh, actually, there's people, uh, lots of people who are not here today who could have been here today and, and with us. Uh, one of them, Simon Evans, uh, who was a director who's had a very glittering career and was around a couple of years before you, I think, Sam, wasn't he? And Alexander Spencer-Jones. Well, I think, yeah, one okay. Year yeah, a year, year above, perhaps, Alexander Spencer-Jones. And one of the things I noticed in, in the work that tends to happen in drama production, which has often bled into your subsequent careers, is a kind of really bold handling of classical texts, you know, dismantling, deconstructing them and so on. You've already mentioned, Sam, your, your approach to Macbeth, mm. and we've, we've all, we touched on your masked version of The Tempest, I think it was. Um, I, I don't know what mark I gave you, but I'm sure it was very good. Um, yeah, I think so. So what, what, what how, <coughs> is that, that, I mean, we've seen from Simon, obviously there are rules, there are things that you need to get Right, Abby's been absolutely authority in that, and obviously is is kind of feeding a kind of revival, I think, of an awareness of verse speaking, which is you know well founded. Um, what what are your feelings about the classics and Shakespeare, in particular? Why why are they why do you return to them? You've done Cymbeline, for instance, quite recently. Yeah, you, Sam? Uh, I mean, I am much more formal now than I was here, mm. so. I don't really professionally do deconstructed stuff. I actually like the challenge of... So Cymbeline, we did at Sam Wanamaker Playhouse, and everyone tells you that it's really problematic, and it's a mishmash, and it's so many genres, and you either embrace that and you do it, or you just try to find a coherence. So I will always go for coherence, really, to try and make something feel sort of hermetically sealed in terms of its, its vision being strong. So even if you hate something, it's still strong enough to sort of withstand your hate. Um, but in terms of, for me, Shakespeare particularly, it's, it's all language-based. If That's what, what, where I absolutely love it. I love literally diving in and, and going deeper and deeper and deeper. And it will always give you more. And there's nothing worse. It's only happened to me once, uh, working on a play or a musical, when it stops giving. And you start to go, oh, shit, we squeezed the, the lemon dry now. And with Shakespeare, you can never exhaust that. And there's so many sort of stages of it somehow. There's the, there's the one which is like, I have no idea what this is about at all. I'm going to Wikipedia it, or I'm going to thing it. Or then I'm going to get the Arden, which is my preferred <laughs> issue, uh, uh, edition. And these are really exciting. And then I would go through those horrendous footnotes at the bottom. I remember them. And they are very heavy. I've just moved house. And those old Ardens weigh an absolute ton. <laughs> these would be 99p. There's a great bookshop that's closed now down there, that academic bookshop. But... Um, to go back to, yeah, so I like to get into the language and then you have the stage of, of understanding what the words might mean or at least making a choice to think you know what they mean. Then you, make the, then you have the stage of hearing it aloud, which is a wonderful thing, like hearing a piece of music suddenly. And then you have all the choices within that. But, I mean, one thing that Simon said, I think the joy of Shakespeare is you have to be A, open-hearted, yeah. B, you have to commit to it, and C, one of the great revelations of that was I used to think that if it's prose... Uh, let me get this right, that it, would, it was like honest and naturalistic. But actually the opposite is true. The verse is the free expression of emotion and the honest expression of emotion. Whereas when it's in prose, that's more, that's people covering up and being tricky with each other. So there's a great scene in um, Cymbeline, it's Iacomo and Posthumus. And Iacomo basically, basically says to this stranger he's just met, who he hears is the bee's knees and everyone loves him, he says, I bet I can go and have sex with your wife, who you keep telling me is this, you know, um, perfect woman, and they have they set a wager that he can, and then the play starts. But that's all written in prose, and it's because they're all navigating each other. And there's a great preview of it where Dominic Drumgall came up to me, and the two actors who were, doing, were both Irish, and he said, They're just trying to out James Dean each other because it was all very like it was all like, I can throw it away more than you, and I can do it quieter than you, and you're going to miss this. And what it needed was for them to be open-hearted and front-footed. I think that's what Simon was itching at when he was saying, he was sort of doing this and like walking up and he just means that it has to be out there rather than kind of introverted. 
So what is it? Well, it's detail, and again, it's the emotional life of it, I just think, is amazing. And I do think it's like a puzzle, and I do think it's difficult. And there are various tricks that you learn along the way. You know, it's like this, one of my favorite ones is, and Giles Block taught me this, he's a master of words at the Globe, he said, rather than thinking of pausing at the end of a line, which I think is a Patsy Rodenbow, Peter Hall thing, which is brilliant, he, was, he would say that what you really do is you're breathing before the next line to get ready to set, send yourself into it. Now, either way, you engineer a pause. And I'd be so interested, not that we should do it, but I was reading that while it was being read brilliantly by the students there, and you go, if you just pause at the end of each line for a second, it does something, and I can't tell you what, it just places it in the air or something, it's magical. And then another one I love, finally, is that you just read the last word of each line, just read it as a list, and oddly enough, that will take you through a feeling of what that speech is as well. And also, it just shows you it's very important to hit the last word, because there's a lot in it. Max, how about yourself? I mean, obviously, you did a lot of Shakespeare. You were here, you, you were involved with the Elsinore project. You toured uh, uh, the... Um, Midsummer's Dreams. Midsummer's Dreams, Dreams. yeah. 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 Um, and I also it, did an hour-long Macbeth in Edinburgh, weirdly enough. Yeah. There you go. Let's have a club. <laughs> Look at us. Was it, called, was it called The Hour as well? Or it was, was it? actually called The Curse of Macbeth. Oh, okay. That's what it was called. <laughs> yeah, and it was a sort of horror version of it in some ways, um, which I guess it is anyway. Um, well, yeah, I, I guess it's interesting because I think what you say about classics standing up to um, experimentation is interesting to me. I th and, and you mentioned me spending time in Europe, and that is something that I've done a lot of. And I, I think there's... I, I've been trying to gradually work out what it is that I've been looking for there. I, don't, I You know, I wasn't necessarily sh sure what I was what I was aiming to achieve by doing that in the first place. But I think if the thing that I've carried forward from that is trying to find a place. As a, a friend of mine once put it as being a kind of, uh, what did he say? It's like a first, a first-hand creative, I think was the word he used. It's made, there's, there's almost certainly a better way of describing that out there. But I think, it, you know, I think directing is quite an interesting role because it's in some ways you're, you're captain of a process or, or you're... Or you're you're steering something, but at the same time, it can be quite a kind of subjugatory process to a, to a text, and I think that's something that particularly in Britain, I think, is the case. I think, I think it's, a, it's a bit of a time, uh, a bit of a worn-out idea, this idea of Britain being a kind of writer's theatre and maybe some of the Europe being more of a director's theatre or something. But I, I think... I think they're quite... They're not, not very helpful definitions in some ways, but I, what I think I took going forwards was this, this attempt, trying, trying to find ways to bring something of myself as a, as a kind of work of art to a, a piece of theatre. And I think Shakespeare allows you to do that, and I think you kind of have to do it, because what, in some ways, what's the... And that doesn't mean it's got to be wild and experimental, but it, you've got to bring something of yourself to that, otherwise why do it again and again and again? Mm. it has got to be something that you're connecting to in it, I think. And it's why I've ended up I think writing more, and that's why I've ended up working on pieces where I can do that to it. And and I think I've definitely carried that that forwards from it. Um, and I think one day I might go back there, but it's it's not right now. No, no. I, uh, but it's lovely to hear that done again. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, you know, the end stopping thing. I've, I've heard all sorts of stories. I think, in fact, I think Abby probably told this story about Peter Hall um, clapping at the end of lines and and Judy Dench and and. Uh, it, Swap it. She was playing Titania, I think, and, and she and Oberon swapped costumes and back again while he was. <laughs> he had, he'd have his, his head in the text and he'd be looking and he, like this, and at the end of every line, bap, like that. And then they, they, did, they did both back and he didn't know this was. They were doing this whole scene in front of him, which can't be true, but I love the idea that it is. Anyway, yeah. I'm sure it is true. Um, <laughs> I think, unfortunately, we might need to stop. I kept thinking we should have questions, we should... But actually, that's the purpose, I think, of our canapes and drinks and breakout session and so forth. So uh, before we do close and I'll hand back to Joel, I just want to say thank you to our wonderful panel, Sarah and Sam and Max, and we we'll put our hands together for them. And, and, of course, thank you to the audience. Thanks for coming. Uh, Joel. I have no more to add. I, uh, there are two.
too many people to thank as ever. I do want to thank um, colleagues in the development office who have brought this event together. Thank you very much to you. Uh, and thank you to all for coming. Um, trying to pull some threads from this very diverse experience. And all I can think of is Simon Russell Bill going <laughs> like this and thinking just, just how giving uh, performance is, how you can't stop giving. It's always a giving out. And um, so I want to thank everyone for giving their time, you for giving your support. But now take. Uh, go and take and enjoy some drinks and some nibbles and do meet the guests and meet the characters that you've been seeing playing on the stage before you. Thank you very much. Thank you.